Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you, Monica. Thank you, John. Thank you, audience, for still being here. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to finally um, sort of uh, be here. And I wanted to, uh, I'm an architectural historian. Um, and I think maybe the only one on the panel. Um, and I'm going to start uh, by taking a historical perspective. Um, and I'm going to uh, start with this, which is something that uh, Lucia Ale um, uh, showed an image of. And that is uh, a reference to a project that I did a few years ago. Actually, now it's almost, uh, it's more than 10 years ago when I did some research in connection with this special issue of the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians um, on the discipline of architectural history um, that I edited. And in the process of doing that research, I discovered a few things. First, I discovered that the question of what the appropriate role for architectural history is in the education of the architect uh, and specifically in the MArt program, seems to resurface, actually, as an issue at regular intervals. And in fact, on fairly regular 20-year uh, cycles. Um, the last one, I would say, that was pervasive was in the early 1990s when the issue was uh, theory, um, which threw uh, architectural history uh, into uh, crisis, um, in the good sense. And the second thing that I discovered is that the cycle is chronicled in the JSAH. Um, and uh, Lucia mentioned this, that it, 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 she showed the, the 1940s and the 1960s um, issues. And Andrew just mentioned this discussion, which took place actually in the JSAH. And third, I discovered that the uh, in the JSAH, the issue is configured in terms of a disciplinary crisis or a crisis uh, of disciplinary identity. And that over the decades, it has been the cause for a great deal of soul searching on the part of historians of architecture who institutionally are neither fully at home in art history nor in architecture and feel like they're always on the edge of homelessness. Um, and two of the earliest contributions to this recurrent debate struck me as providing uh, interesting insights into the issue that we're concerned with in this session. Both of them were published in the very first issues of the journal in 1942 and 1943 by uh, sort of acknowledged fathers uh, of American architectural history. And both addressed gen the general concern that, as they called it, a new history of architecture was needed uh, for architecture schools. The first of these, um, in January 1942, was by Carol Meeks, who was an architectural historian at Yale. And Meeks pro proposed that the new history of architecture, as he put it, should speak to current architectural problems. The situation was serious, he noted, because in recent years, quote, books have, been, have appeared on themes as superficial as how to obliterate the past or how to, make the new, uh, how to make the new look novel. And architectural schools, he claimed, had yielded to this pressure by shortening the time spent on history, but they had not substantially changed the way in which that history was taught. Most, he said, continued to give the same stylistic kind of history as before. Although he noted that there were uh, sort of notable exceptions, um, Lewis Mumford, Talbot Hamlin, and Siegfried Gideon, uh, who, as he put it, make their historical research an indispensable tool for dealing with contemporary problems. This kind of history, which Meeks suggested, was more appropriately called training in the evolution of architecture, examines buildings in terms of the conditions of their making, thereby providing a perspective that does much to put contemporary problems into sharper focus. If architectural historians were to revise their methods accordingly, he concluded, history would once again speak to architects and to today's critical problems. So in other words, Meeks here is proposing a Gideon-like instrumental history, 
And in fact, historically, this was just after Gideon had given the uh, Norton lectures at Harvard that became space, time, and architecture. Now, the second intervention is uh, actually more significant uh, and, and interesting in many ways. Um, and that was made a year and a half later in July 1943 by John Coolidge uh, at Harvard, who was teaching at Harvard, who took up Meeks's proposal in an article entitled Preliminary Steps Towards the New History of Architecture. And I think that today, uh, even today, uh, Coolidge's remarks are uh, remarkably prescient. He wrote, when our generation pleads for a new architectural history, it is not jettisoning the theories of the past. It is merely maintaining that collectively those theories do not permit a sufficiently complete explanation of the phenomena. It is calling for new hypotheses, theory in other words. And he proposes, it is possible looking forward today to foresee two different and supplementary hypotheses which will arise in succession as explanations for architecture. The first of these, he notes, is that historians will soon show that architecture can be explained entirely as the resultant of structural systems, aesthetic will, and sociology. This belief is almost an axiom among architectural historians uh, today, he said. And so I think that um, one can sense here, uh, you know, Carl Condit's um, Chicago School, but also an interesting connection here is Henry Russell Hitchcock's article on the architecture of bureaucracy and the architecture of genius, which appeared in the Architectural Review in 1947, which was trying to institutionalize um, that very idea. Now, about the second hypothesis, Coolidge said, it was not possible to be so precise. But, and this is the interesting bit, it will concern itself with the connection between architecture and that vague complex of studies known as intellectual history. It is, I would say, as if Coolidge had foreseen Colin Rowe, oppositions, and assemblage. But most interesting, uh, he noted, and this is um, key here, that there was a problem with this approach to architectural history, or as he put it, architecturals run into a methodological difficulty here because uh, we know so little of the way in which buildings are affected by ideas that it is impossible to de discern the effect of determinate ideas. And that is because, as he put it, we lack a bridge between ideas and formal organization. And when he's talking about ideas here, I'm assuming that he's not talking about the ideas of individual architects and how they affect their work, but he's talking about political ideas and social ideas and philosophical ideas. And I would reframe his uh, assertion here by saying that what we lack is essentially a theoretical bridge that can account for the fact that the relationship between ideas and formal organization are highly unstable and constantly changing. And I would say, actually, that it is the burden of theory and history in schools of architecture and the value of teaching history in the context of architectural education that that very issue should be constantly engaged and problematized. And I'd in fact go a little further um, to say that the most important contribution uh, of history to the discipline and practice of architecture, and especially the education of architects, is a critical habit of mind that is primarily and fundamentally concerned with understanding change. And here, of course, I'm invoking um, Manfredo Tafuri, as so many others have before me here, um, and particularly in the sphere in the labyrinth where Tafuri asserted that the historical project is always a project of crisis. History of itself, of course, as we know, he said, is a project of crisis, and in the sense that it is never definitive and always provisional because it, as he put it, ceaselessly questions its own materials and methods. It therefore reconstructs them, the materials and methods, and continuously reconstructs itself. Now, a number of things I think are interesting here. 
uh, and speak to uh, the role of history in architectural education. The first is the conception of history as a project and as projective, uh, active, that projects backwards and forwards and is actively shaped. Uh, and that history here is not the underlying meaning in Jameson's sense, but it is actually a project that is constantly changing. And the second is that the concept of history as a project is permanently in crisis, that is in transition, is unstable and dynamic. And crisis conceived in this way is not only uh, a sign of vitality and resistance, it is actually a critical habit of mind and a fundamental condition, I would say, of historical thinking. Now, I would suggest that a discipline whose project is to understand change must repeatedly throw itself into crisis, into self-questioning. The third factor, the notion of history as project, implies that the production of history itself is a practice that it is self-critical and it constitutes a body of knowledge that is constantly being reshaped and can be shaped in many different ways as opposed to uh, some notion of a static canon. So the question is how to integrate that into teaching. Um, through history courses, I would say, um, at the GSD we've tried to do that. Um, I take no responsibility for this, it happened long before I I got there with a program called Buildings, Texts, and Contexts that links uh, design, theory, and history by looking at buildings, texts, and contexts, self-explanatory. But I would also like to suggest that there's another way that I have actually been experimenting with over the last few years, and that is through research projects. And I thought I would um, just show you a, uh, an example of what I mean by that. Um, here is a project uh, that um, was called Project Zagreb. Uh, it was a research project. Uh, it was a book. Um, these are images. Uh, it, was, it was sponsored by the um, Croatia Airlines, who did an article on it in the in-flight magazine. Uh, and here we are, the Harvardski Studentski. And this is the book that we produced afterwards, and these were some of the images that um, people took of us as we wandered around the city. But it began as a research seminar with half, uh, half MR students and half PhD students. We went to Croatia. We met with city plan the city planning office and Croatian Society of Architects. We talked with architects in practice, with planners and historians. We researched in archives, and mainly we walked the city several times uh, and photographed it and so on. And the research itself began to shape the project. Um, the project itself was first conceived as being about the socialist city and the post-socialist condition, um, which I thought was timely because uh, both were uh, rapidly disappearing. Um, but very soon it became clear that you can't generalize, that neither the socialist city nor the post-socialist city actually exists as such. And instead, that pre-socialist, socialist, and post-socialist Zagreb uh, were all characterized by certain conditions, and that those conditions were political and economic stability that you couldn't plan, and distance from power that uh, the, the process for making decisions uh, didn't exist there, or, or as Charles Mayer uh, one, of our one of my colleagues says, uh, there was, there was a, a lack of coherence between um, decision and identity space uh, in Zagreb, which I think is an evocative way of doing that. Now, um, so I framed a new question here, which was how does architecture, which is predicated on stability and being able to take the long view, how does architecture under those conditions in which normative practices are impossible uh, and especially uh, long-term planning doesn't work, how does architecture operate under those conditions um, and within different conditions of uh, sort of political conditions? And unfortunately, we can't really see this, but this is some of the analysis that we did of political change uh, 
uh, illustrated by monuments in the city. Here you, you can't see it, but these are how the country itself changed and the city grew and so on and so forth. But um, one thing we discovered, and I just want to show you this uh, very quickly, was that under these conditions, architecture becomes urban active. It takes responsibility for the city. And here is an example uh, just of how this process worked. Here are two modern buildings, modernist buildings, built in the uh, 1930s, actually by the same architect. Both of them inserted into a traditional 19th century city block. Uh, they're both modernist, and yet they fit into that block. Uh, at first, they just seem to be perfectly competent modernist buildings behaving like traditional urban perimeter blocks. But then we examined them uh, a little more closely, and we examined the site before and after construction with historical maps and photographs and so on, and we saw that they were, in fact, transformative urban buildings that changed the relationship between public and private space in the city and how urban space was used. In fact, we discovered that the PLOT here actually opened up uh, the space into the city block and created a passage through the building into the interior of the block, that the two buildings, in fact, were connected by a covered passage here, uh, and in the passage were shops and workshops and so on. So these buildings were urban active buildings, and through photographs we began to understand why. Here's the site. This is one building is here, one building here. You can see an enormous block. A city street had been planned, but it hadn't been built, so that this passage was being used informally uh, by people just walking through it. So the new buildings used, and here you can see a corner building had been built, the street hadn't, and here's that passageway. So that the new buildings used a modernist vocabulary uh, of forms, the piloti and so on, um, <coughs> to create a new kind of public urban space on private property. And so here you have that whole process uh, demonstrated. Uh, and the passage through the city block. And a published drawing of, uh, was, or a drawing of this, was published uh, to sort of um, open source uh, the strategy here. And today it's uh, being turned into a sort of modernist, uh, a modern contemporary, not modernist at all, uh, a contemporary passage. Uh, and it's become the informal urbanism has become formal, formal urbanism. So this unregulated has become regulated. And we found um, many other examples of this, which we mapped then in this part of the city. And we also just quickly developed new methods because we found that traditional historical me um, methods were not really effective uh, or useful in these conditions because histor the historical record wasn't there. Uh, documents were either missing or unreliable. And this happens in politically volatile uh, conditions. There were too many variables and so on. And so we needed new methods for analyzing and visualizing change um, in terms of mapping and diagramming and layering and so on. And the most interesting tool that we developed uh, was a peeling back of the fabric of the city um, from the present. And here I'll just show you an example. This is a, a plan for a new city center, 1947 modernist plan, Corbusian. And so we looked at that, and we mapped where the, uh, the, the new buildings were planned to be. Uh, in the fabric here, the black ones showed the pre-existing ones, and this is the sort of pre-socialist uh, uh, property divisions. And then we looked at it in 1963, and we saw that there were some buildings built, but other buildings had been moved and shifted, and the whole thing was incredibly dynamic. So we discovered that the process here was that actually these boulevards, the plan had not been built at all, that architecture, and here the red is the new buildings, was actually shaping urbanism in this condition because you couldn't plan, but you could build. And so here we discovered this great boulevard, which is the avenue of the proletarian brigades, had never been laid out like a socialist prospect, but had actually been defined by architectural objects. Um, built along it. So the point here is that we came to understand the urban agency of the architecture by using analytical methods of graphic analysis that were informed by historical thinking. 
And that gave us a more complete understanding of the instrumentality of architecture because it accounts for duration in architecture, the ongoing life uh, of the building, which is very significant, uh, which often the full significance of a building, of a work, is only really clear uh, over time when you see what it does. And in the reverse reading, you get to the, the impact before you get to the plan. You get to uh, what the building does before you get to what it was intended to do. So and we did this back and forth reading plus back and forth with uh, theory and, um, and the research. So basically, there's a reciprocal questioning of materials and assumptions, a reciprocity between research and theory here, and we also used other media. We used film that was made at the time. Uh, we used um, uh, fiction film. Uh, we, used, we made our own films and so on. So that it involves, the important thing here is that it involves reading the city and architecture in terms of strategy and agency rather than as historical record or as artifact. Thank you. <laughs>